But before we get to all that, first some breaking news for you. Police are on the scene at the Virginia Supreme Court building in Richmond due to a bomb threat. Now, the building has been evacuated and residents are being told to avoid the area. This is a developing story and we'll bring you more details as we get them. All right. As the hours tick by to the end of the Trump presidency, there is a report that he and Melania will be winging their way to Mar-a-Lago on the morning of the inauguration, the last time they fly Air Force One. Let's check in with our White House correspondent, Emerald Robinson, who spoke to the president's lawyer, by the way, Rudy Giuliani. Emerald. Uh, yeah, so the President Melania is set to leave out on Wednesday morning. There's a question about how big this might be a bigger, uh, cer more ceremonial departure at JBA than we're used to seeing, but the White House isn't confirming that as of yet. But clearly, also as the President leaves Washington, D.C., he leaves in the shadow of another impeachment trial. Nancy Pelosi saying today that her impeachment managers are working on the trial and preparing for it, even though uh, she's not quite sure as of yet on the timing of sending the article over to the Senate. The question is, who will represent the president this time? There's a couple names floating out there, including Rudy Giuliani, who, as you said, I spoke with about this impeachment recently. Take a listen. So let's talk about the future, because the president, according to more than one recent poll this week, is still the person that most Republicans would like to see on the ballot in 2024. Will he run again? Well, that's what, what that's exactly what the impeachment's about. Impeachment is, is not about, they didn't even charge, uh, the crime of incitement to riot is so far beyond what he did with enormous protections for free speech that it's almost idiotic to talk about it. I mean, there's, he, he didn't, every law professor that's in the middle of the road will tell you it's a perfectly, perfectly, uh, per perfectly legal speech, mm -hmm. as were all the rest. Incitement to riot virtually means, you know, T taking him into the riot, you know, come with me, not not language, not even uh, angry language. So this was a setup. Well, and McConnell says he doesn't know how he's going to vote, which means McConnell might be leaning towards uh, actually convicting the president. Does he want to do that? Does McConnell want to end the possibility of the president running again in 2024? I can't speak for Senator McConnell. I'm very disappointed in him. Very disappointed in the things that he did, the things that he said. Um, he knows better. He's a, he's a smart enough man, or smart enough man to know that this, this. Uh, uh, I mean, I can't say for sure. Four years is a long time, but um, well, they sure as heck think he wants to run. That's why they're doing this to him, and, it, and it's maybe the only way they can beat him, because next time uh, he'll be for, forewarned and forearmed about just exactly what they're trying to get away with. And I predict over the next year, a lot more information will come out about, about this. And Bob and Heather, if we know anything, it might just be 2021, but if the last four years are any uh, indication, uh, 2024 will come quickly. Bob, Heather. Yeah, by the way, Emerald, any, there are reports out there that the president isn't going to pay Rudy Giuliani, and I know that's kind of inside baseball stuff, but uh, any indications on yeah. the, the dynamic of the relationship between the two gentlemen? Yeah, that's a really good question, Bob, and I actually asked the mayor about that. I asked about requesting $20,000 a day from the president. He said that he has not. He did not ask him for that, so he's denying those claims and saying that he has worked pro bono because he wanted to do this for the country and he contends that the relationship between him and President Trump are still really strong. As I said, some people have mentioned that Giuliani could even represent the president in this uh, possible impeachment trial. I asked him if he would do that. If he was asked, he said, of course, if asked, he would do that. But there's also other names floating around as well. Yeah. Okay. Emerald, thank you very much. Well, right now, uh, as Emerald could tell you, tight Thanks. security in the U.S. Capitol as the FBI tracks online chatter regarding calls for a violent protest for next Wednesday's presidential inauguration. Our national correspondent, Logan Raddick, is on Capitol Hill. He has the latest details. Logan. Bob Heather, Capitol Hill is currently a fortress. You can see the security barrier behind me right on the edge of Union Station, the main train station here in Washington, D.C. Up to 21,000 National Guard members will be deployed here in D.C. for the inauguration of Joe Biden. But even with this heavy protection, FBI Director Christopher Wray is still worried that we could see violence not only here at our nation's capital, but in state capitals across the country. 
threat. And if we find that an individual poses a violent threat, then we and our partners will take advantage of every lawful authority and method we've got to disrupt uh, any attempt or, or attack. Our posture is aggressive, and it's going to stay that way through the inauguration. Ray is receiving encouragement from Vice President Mike Pence to crack down on bad actors. Uh, uh, the American people uh, deserve uh, a safe inauguration on January 20th. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to convey to all of the members of your teams uh, to continue to lean forward to ensure that we achieve. And this morning, the National Park Service closed the National Mall to the public. That happened at 11 a.m. and will be in effect until the day after Inauguration Day. And with the pandemic, a lot of people have been going to the mall to get their outdoor exercise, but that will not be the case until after Joe Biden becomes president. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Logan. Well, President Trump was impeached by the House in a vote that moved at lightning speed. Ten Republicans joined the Democrats. But Florida Congresswoman Kat Kamek voted against the impeachment and joins us now to explain why she voted the way she did. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you with us. A explain to the folks at home why you did not vote to impeach President Trump. Absolutely. And thanks for having me. And I apologize. I know I'm looking like I, I'm auditioning for the Weather Channel right now, but actually <laughs> we're en route to a, 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 another meeting with the state party here in Florida. And, and it really gets to the heart of the last 12 days. In fact, my first 12 days in office as a representative. You know, I voted to oppose the impeachment because our country right now does not need more political gimmicks. This whole process was just a political sham and really a disservice to our founding fathers who who took this move very seriously. And none of the due process was in place for the president. There was no judiciary hearing. There was no debate. It was simply a, a rushed process to make a political point. And I'm so disappointed in my colleagues that voted that way. But, you know, they have to vote their conscience at the end of the day for me. It was a constitutional move. It was the right move to oppose this sham impeachment, because right now, more than ever, we need leaders that have cool, calm heads that are looking to do the work that the American people sent them to Washington to do. Congresswoman, take us back a week ago, a uh, week ago Wednesday. What happened to you and what did you do after the all heck started breaking loose? Well, you know, I was actually on the House floor when uh, the Capitol was breached. I had begun receiving text messages from Capitol Police saying shelter in place, we're moving a word. But mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, I was extremely furious and watching my colleagues in Capitol Police push back against yeah. these rioters. And you're also taking some action, uh, uh, Congresswoman Kamek. You are a steering member of this effort to, to you've introduced this Save Democracy Act. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it gets back to the core issue of why we objected to the electoral certification of those particular states in the first place. So many people have accused us of making this about overturning the election or or being a political ploy. Absolutely not. They never had that argument when the Democrats did it four years ago or in 2005. Uh, and so it was just ludicrous. I had just taken my oath of office. And really what it gets down to is Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2. We have to hold these states accountable that allowed their lower circuit courts or their state election officials to usurp their state legislature's authority to determine the time and manner of which their state elections took place. So this broke the integrity and the trust in our electoral system. And that's what the Save Democracy Act is all about. It's led by uh, Chairman Jim Banks, who is spearheading this effort. We have some very strong common sense measures that we're going to push forward to put in place to restore the faith in our election system. If Americans don't feel confident going into the ballot box and that their vote is being counted as it's intended to be cast, what the heck are we doing here? And that's something that we're not going to let go of. We're going to fight hard all the way to make sure that every American's voice, every legal ballot gets cast and counted the way that it's intended to. So check out the uh, Save Democracy Act. Again, RSC has been championing this and pushing this. We've got a lot of co-sponsorship and support. If your representative is in on it, encourage them to do so. Uh, by the way, uh, we have some pictures of you serving coffee. We're answering the call to serve their, their country. And uh, so we actually got to meet several members of the Virginia, the Pennsylvania, New York and Ohio Guard. And I just had a conversation today with our Florida Guard. They are en route to Washington, D.C. I'm so proud 
of every single man and woman who has answered the call to serve. They're doing a tremendous job protecting our nation's capital right now, uh, lowering the temperature. And I just wanted to show a little bit of appreciation and support. I actually took about 50 of them on a, on a behind the scenes tour of our nation's capital. It was the least that we can do considering everything that they're putting on the line and sacrificing for us right now. All right, Congresswoman Kat Kamek, thank you so much for joining us and good luck to you and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. All right, uh, those 10 GOP lawmakers who voted in support of the Democrats' impeachment of President Trump, well, they could find themselves out of a job pretty soon for the details. Let's go to our man with his ear to the ground. That's White House correspondent John Gizzi. John. Bob, 48 hours after the 10 lawmakers on the Republican side voted to impeach President Trump, there's been new focus on South Carolina's five-term congressman, Tom Rice. He's considered a strong conservative and a longtime supporter of President Trump. He even voted not to accept the electoral votes from Pennsylvania, saying the attorneys for the other side made a convincing case. But he also is one of what's being called the Gang of Ten, voting for President Trump's impeachment. Newsmax spoke last night to Drew McKissick, Republican State Chairman of South Carolina, who said flatly that Congressman Rice's position puts him in a very awkward spot in, and I quote, the most Trumpian district in the state. This is a district that went 59% for President Trump, as the rest of the Palmetto State was going 55% for the president. In addition, Chairman McKissick said that one judges uh, the strength of the party individually by how its straight ticket voting goes. 2016, uh, Republicans won the straight party ticket vote by 2.6% of the vote. Two years later, it was up to 8% of the vote, and in 2020, it was a whopping 17% of the vote for a straight ticket. All of this in Congressman Rice's 7th District. Chairman McKissick said without hesitation he expects a strong challenge, possibly from former Lieutenant Governor Andre Bauer, but in any event, it's two years to go almost before the next election, and Tom Rice is under fire in South Carolina. Bob? Hmm. Bauer would be an right. interesting uh, choice there, for sure. Uh, thank you very much, John. Coming up, we'll be back. Shelters here with Heather Childers. Some breaking news as well. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy has announced that out of an abundance of caution, all New Jersey state workers will work from home next Wednesday, Inauguration Day. All 50 state capitals and the District of Columbia are on high alert. Many have called out the National Guard for what law enforcement says could be violent protests between now and Inauguration Day, which is, of course, as we said, next Wednesday. Heather. Well, Democrats wasted no time impeaching the president, saying that his words incited the Capitol riot. Uh, the president is only days away from leaving office. So how will this play out? Joining us now to put it into perspective for us is our very own Tom Basile, host of America Right Now. Nice to see you, Tom. Uh, Good so to see you, Heather. What do you think about some of the information that is now beginning to come out? Because this really was a rushed impeachment, what, five days. Uh, and now we know that a lot of folks and a lot of the information that's coming in backs up the idea that this was pre-planned prior to the rally that day. Yeah, look, and, and it also has been suggested that Nancy Pelosi may have even gotten a security and intelligence briefing that uh, that there could have been trouble that day. But it's very, very clear that Democrats blame this entirely on on Donald Trump and on the president's speech that day. So I think that that may be one of the reasons why they caucused and they decided that they were going to move as fast as they did with this. I call it a drive by impeachment. Um, and again, it, this is exactly what the founders warned us not to do, using our institutions as a as a political weapon. Uh, and now they have this uh, they have these impeachment articles that they have not sent to the Senate. Uh, and it sets up an unprecedented uh, potential uh, trial or even constitutional crisis to some degree uh, in uh, in the upper chamber post inauguration day. 
You've held office. You've also been a lawyer, uh, a, a puppet, a poet, a pawn, and a king. You've done a lot. So I want to ask you about the process where you have um, the information that may be added later. Um, assuming, yeah. and I'll get your opinion on this, can they even try this case when he's not in office? And if so, how can they change it? Because it's like uh, when you charge somebody with something, that's what leads to, to either conviction or exoneration. And it seems here where they're going to add more information after they've already impeached him. That doesn't, it seems like it's a backward process. Well, it's a totally backward process, and that's because it was entirely political. It wasn't about public safety. It, it wasn't about Donald Trump being a threat to the nation or anything like that. This is a political move. Um, to your question, Bob, it's a very good question. Uh, and uh, and look, uh, we're we're in uncharted territory. Uh, but uh, but it, uh, I've talked to a number of constitutional scholars. Certainly, our own Alan Dershowitz, uh, Senator Tom Cotton also has said this is not going to be constitutional if they try to proceed with a trial. Uh, likely that the Chief Justice of the United States, who ordinarily would preside over a trial in the Senate, would not preside over the trial of a private citizen. So who then becomes the judge? The President of the Senate, the newly sworn in uh, Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. And uh, what the Trump uh, folks, his, his lawyers, his legal team should do is uh, submit a motion to dismiss this. And then likely the Supreme Court of the United States would then have to rule on any appeal because the Democrats would uh, the Democrats would uh, would rule uh, uh, would rule against the, the Trump lawyers to dismiss this for lack of jurisdiction. The Senate cannot convict and remove somebody who's already out of office. And uh, and so I think that there's a legal case that this is un this would be an unconstitutional measure for the Senate to take up. What if um, President Trump and his attorneys decided they didn't want to file a motion to dismiss? What if President Trump at this point, seeing all of this additional information that is coming out that in essence exonerates him if they try to stick with the plan that his rally and the words that he spoke at the rally specifically um, sparked all of this? What if he wants to come out and clear his name? Well, remember, this isn't a criminal trial. It is a trial that would have a very specific purpose, and that is to, Im to remove somebody from public office. And there's also going to be an, an open question as to whether or not the 14th Amendment issue of, of somebody, uh, of, of whether or not they can prevent him from running for office mm -hmm. um, if uh, through, a, through a conviction in the Senate, whether or not that is even constitutional. Uh, but I think that it's important for the Trump people and the Republicans to also consider that uh, this is the perfect smokescreen for the Democrats to continue to advance a radical agenda. Uh, if you want to keep your boogeyman out there in the press and you want to try and deflect attention from a massive spending bill, for instance, what better than uh, than the trial of the century with uh, featuring featuring Donald Trump in the, in the United States Senate? So Republicans. Uh, Democrats have decided they're going to go down this road. Republicans have to be very careful as to whether or not they want to uh, they want to pay uh, any mind to what is is likely an unconstitutional move. OK, we saw how you slipped in that massive spending bill comment there, and we'll be talking more about that, of course. Uh, Tom Basile, thank you very much. And folks, remember, you can catch Tom every week right here on Newsmax America right now. Airs and welcome back to American Agenda. I'm Heather Childers. I'm Bob Sellers. Some breaking news now. The Michigan State Legislature has announced that it will not hold any sessions between the 19th and the 21st due to what they're calling credible threats. Now, obviously, Michigan has been a hotbed of controversy over the last six months or so. Uh, and next, the 19th to the 21st, of course, is next Tuesday through Thursday. And as, of course, the January uh, 20th, Wednesday is when the inauguration takes place. But this is applying to the Michigan State Legislature. Again, no sessions between Tuesday and Thursday of next week. Just wanted to let you know that was going on. Also coming up on today's show, we've got a lot more. But first, let's check in with Amanda Brilhanti for a all right, Amanda, thank you. Many are wondering how our economy is going to fare under a new Biden administration. We'll take a look at what President-elect Joe Biden had to say about prioritizing small businesses in low-income areas. Our priority will be black, Latino, Asian, and Native American-owned small businesses, women-owned businesses, and finally having equal access to resources needed to reopen and rebuild. 
but we're going to make a concerted effort to help small businesses in low-income communities, in big cities, small towns, rural communities that have faced systemic barriers to relief. All right, to discuss former Trump administration economic advisor Stephen Moore. Stephen, is this the time to do politics like that? Well, you know, the real I irony of this is that these Democrats keep talking about how they want to help minority businesses. And look, everybody's for that. But what they're not saying is that the businesses that got crushed, just flattened by the Democratic uh, lockdowns all over the country in states like Michigan and Illinois and California, and New Jersey and New York with Democratic governors, those were the minority businesses and the minority workers. And everybody gains when everybody uh, uh, has success. <laughs> Um, but right now, what do you think the focus should be? Uh, they brought out the so-called rescue plan. I wanted to get your assessment of that and whether it's a good thing or whether it's going to stay the way it is or needs to change before it passes the House and then the Senate. Well, this this is a, a fiscal atrocity, this bill that uh, that uh, Joe Biden talked about last night. Another one point nine trillion dollars of debt on top of that. Look, we just passed a trillion dollar stimulus bill two or three weeks ago, uh, Joe Biden said he was going to be a, remember, he said he's going to be a moderate Democrat. He'll be a centrist. Uh, he's not going no. to be in the Bernie Sanders. He should want to get uh, that, that injection into the economy as quickly as possible without playing politics. Tell me the effect raising the minimum wage would have. Now, any uh, state can raise minimum wage right now. But there's a big difference between if you have a business in, in Alabama or Mississippi and one in Seattle. So to make this a national thing, is this the right time to focus on that? No, it's, a, it's the worst time because you've got uh, so many bars and restaurants and stores have been shut down and they're barely able to stay profitable and in business and they're facing bankruptcy. Now Joe Biden is going to is going to uh, blast them with a requirement that they raise their wages when they're barely able to stay in business. It's the worst time. And incidentally, this has not gotten a lot of attention. But in that minimum wage requirement of $15 an hour, that might make sense in a state like New York or New Jersey. But, you know, Alabama, Arkansas, West Virginia, that's going right. to destroy hundreds of thousands of jobs. And, and people don't realize this. They also get rid of what's called hip credit which is that, you know, restaurants don't have to pay the minimum wage to workers because anyone who's ever worked as a tip worker, you make your money from the tips. Now it's $15 an hour plus tips. That's going to mm. kill the businesses. It's going to kill our restaurants. Yeah. And we have we have yeah. 12 million Americans who are employed in that industry. They're going to get clobbered. And that means people don't get the jobs they otherwise that might get. So. Yeah. That, that's All right, Steve, Stephen Moore, always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much. And Thank you. folks, we'll be back with more of American Agenda right after this. And welcome back to American Agenda. I'm Heather Childers along with Bob Sellers. Let's check in with Amanda Brohanty for a look at some of the coronavirus stories that are making headlines right now. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Heather. Yeah, that's right. We actually have some breaking news. The global COVID death toll has passed 2 million. To give you some perspective, it took about eight months for that toll to reach 1 million. And since then, it's been about four months, so half the time to get to the 2 million mark. And here in the United States, the number is about 389,000 dead. Now, that's leaving experts worried about what this could mean moving forward. And the CDC is projecting more than 90,000 people could die of coronavirus in the next three weeks. And this also follows the third 4,000 death toll that we've seen in this month. As we know, earlier this week, there were two days in a row that we surpassed that 4,000 number. Officials say the coronavirus pandemic will drop the life expectancy by a year for 2020 to 77 years, which is the lowest since 2003. And they fear it could last beyond 2020 because of other long term impacts of over in person learning versus virtual school has been ranging since the pandemic started. Many red states especially have carried on with in person learning and no problem, or at least when they come up, they deal with them. But in Democratic run cities like Chicago and New York, students have been online for nearly a year. Now, Chicago's Democratic mayor wants students in the nation's third largest district back in the classroom. To deny these students and their parents the option, let me underscore the option, to get back into this in-person learning environment and to address some of the challenges that they have faced remotely. That would be wrong. 
And we need to give the option of the enhanced benefits that earn in-person learning brings, no question. So joining us now to discuss the importance of sending kids back to school is pediatrician Dr. Diane Hess. She's the founder of Gramercy Pediatrics. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. So what do you think about that? Is it wise for them to send students back to class? And why do you think they're reversing course specifically there in uh, Chicago and some of these red states? I mean, I think this is just, it's taken way too long to get these kids back in school. I am livid that all these kids have been missing out if teachers wear masks and the students wear masks, they can go to school. New York City schools now reopen finally for elementary. Which is open. The schools are open. And then move to Virginia where the schools are not open. And it's, it's psychologically uh, 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 oppressive. It also, they're not learning as well. They're not having the social interaction. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Now, I don't want to be... Uh, unrealistic about this, because even in places where they go back to school, you do get some cases, but yes, you deal with them. So talk about that for a second, because people are talking like, oh, if you get a case, you got to shut down forever. But that's not what's so, happening. So I can tell you, my daughter has been in school the whole time and her school, the classes are potted. So and we're just not like the, all those naysayers.